last week we we continued our discussion of um, an in-depth uh, method of Bible study, and um, we we spent a lot of time talking about themes. I did mention that we would talk about structure and uh, and discerning the the author's purpose. And um, I had someone who who asked me about that because never had it in never had it in his uh, notes, and it's for a very good reason. I didn't ever get to those things. And something else occurred to me. I um, I'm a little bit like a, a lady I met once, delightful lady in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Canada, who um, made the most wonderful. Uh, red lentil soup that I have ever had. And um, so I asked for the recipe and her daughter-in-law wrote it down for me. Problem is, and all the ingredients were there, but none of the, none of the measurements. Well, she didn't know what they were anymore. <laughs> she had done it so long, so often that, that she no longer knew what the measurements were. And I, I feel a little bit like that as I, as I work on this um, method of Bible study. I, I I have been at this so long that a lot of it has become natural, and I don't give a I don't think consciously about uh, about every step. But it's good for me to do that because if I'm teaching it, I really need to think consciously about about the steps. And uh, so I, I may I'll be tweaking this as I go along. One of the things I'm wondering about is when I use the term themes, maybe I'm maybe I'm obscuring, maybe I'm confusing things when I use that that kind of, uh, that term. Um, what we're looking for, and and I, I I have mentioned this in the past, but I really it needs some emphasis. If you've had me before, then you've heard this before. If you haven't had me before, then maybe you haven't heard it, but. Um, Biblical writers, I think chief way of emphasizing things is through repeated words and phrases. I can't stress that too much. Both Old and New Testament writers across the board. There can be a few, few exceptions where they use synonyms rather than repeated words and phrases, but they're very few from what I can tell. And uh, so repeated words and phrases is really huge. And what they do is when, when they repeat a word or a phrase over and over in their document, they, they might as well be shouting at you that this is important because they're, they're, they're emphasizing it for some reason. Now, their, the, their emphasis can be for different reasons. There can be more than one reason why they're emphasizing this word or phrase, and that's part of our process of interpreting is figuring out what uh, what their point is. So, for instance, they could they can repeat certain things because this is the big point, and rather than calling it a theme, maybe I should just call it the big point or the big idea. Every biblical book has a big idea, some big thought. That the that the biblical writer is, is getting across, and very often the way he does that is by repeating some word or phrase or words and phrases. Maybe it's more than one, and they tie together. Um, also, once you found the big idea, you may also find that there are themes, other ideas that support. The big, uh, the big thought, the big idea, and uh, those also appear with repeated words and phrases. So this this works out like this. This can help you in understanding an entire book of the Bible. It can also help you understand a specific passage in the Bible. For instance, of uh, thinking about the whole book in Second Peter, which isn't really a widely known book, I, I find, and that's unfortunate. But 
Second Peter, one of the uh, a, a key term in Second Peter is the word knowledge that appears at different points, strategic points in uh, in that letter. Or um, I've, I think I've mentioned it before, the Gospel of John is filled with with important repeated words and phrases like truth, light, love, and light contrasted with darkness. Um, Terms that have to do with uh, terms that have to do with Jesus, and we're going to be seeing more of that later. But there, there, there's a whole variety of terms. Also, the word signs is important in, in uh, Gospel of John. So is um, uh, believe, and so on. Um, and those go throughout the book. But that also means that if you're studying one specific part of the book, and and one of those terms, or and there are others as well, but and and one of those repeated word, terms or phrases appears in that section, then then what you find throughout the gospel can help you understand how it's what's being said in that section. When I was growing up, I always heard that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, and I agree with that. But I would narrow it. I would narrow the scope of that and say. The best commentary on any book of the Bible is that book. Part of the reason I say that is, and this specifically has to do with the New Testament, but maybe as an illustration, it has to do with the New Testament. For instance, Galatians, uh, Galatians and um, Galatians and First uh, Thessalonians sort of vie for um, for perhaps being the first first book of the New Testament, the first book that was written. Uh, let's say it's Galatians. If you were if you were in the Galatian churches and you received that letter, you wouldn't have had any other letters from Paul or any other letters from anybody else you wouldn't have even had one of the four Gospels. Now, does that mean you wouldn't know anything about Jesus? No, not at all, because if you look at Galatians, and this is a, an interesting fact about Galatians, the um, in, in a kind of an outline form, the entire life of Jesus from his, incar from his pre-incarnation, from eternity to, to his resurrection, in outline form is all in Galatians. You go through there, you find you find these points. You find all those points there from his life. So they knew those things already, even though they didn't have, even though the gospels hadn't been written yet. So, so if you were, if you were one of the uh, in one of those Galatian churches and you received this uh, letter, you you couldn't run over to Ephesians or Romans or Second Corinthians to to get help in understanding. What was going on in, in the in in Galatians, and um, and I think that's the way it's intended. Now, sometimes it helps to go beyond the book we're in, but by and large, uh, we we need to stick with the book until it becomes abundantly clear that we have we, we've gotten we've gotten the message of the book. And now we can go a little bit beyond it, but we don't want to distort the message in this book by by looking at other things. There are certain exceptions. For instance, if a book of the Bible quotes or alludes to something in another book of the Bible, then it's important to understand that quotation or allusion in its context. Um, but again, for the most part, we need to just concentrate on the book we're dealing with and find the information in it. So if we find a theme that runs through a book and or or themes perhaps and these are all um, and these are all there um, in in this one passage then it will help us to to pick up um, 
it will help us to to, to pick up those other uh, themes that run through uh, run through the book, and they serve as kind of a commentary. I mean, for instance, when Jesus says, "I am the truth," it is really helpful in knowing what he was saying about himself to go through all the passages in John that refer to truth and 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 get an idea gather those up because they they will give a commentary they give the context uh, for that so uh, not only do these repeated words and phrases help us in coming up with the key ideas in a book but they also very often help us with structure we're going to come we'll come back to that but uh, sometimes it's repeated words and phrases that give us the outline for the book that that we're dealing with. And, um, well, I'll give one example before I go on. In the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3, there are, one of the unique things about Revelation is, Revelation is a book, it's a letter, it's a series of visions, and within the series of visions, um, and, and within the series of visions, there is um, um, excuse me, something has taken over my screen, a picture of some looks like a car. Yeah, I think um, I think Chuck's um, it, it's his uh, Chuck's if you can hear me, please uh, turn off your camera. If you can do that. Okay. What I'm seeing is a still now. It's not gone, but at least it's not moving. Uh, the picture, I mean. Huh? Um, I assume everybody can see me. I see me, I, but I'm up in the corner. Okay, some only see me, so. Um, for, so in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, some, something that's unique there, there are seven letters within the letter, within the book, within the series of visions. And the seven letters have a familiar or a similar pattern. They begin, uh, they begin with a... a basically the same phrase, and they end with a blessing for the overcomers. And and all seven of them have that same pattern, and it, it shows that there's something about structure there. Or in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 down through chapter 3, verse 7, there is a there's a series of there's a series of teachings that deal with our attitude, Christian attitude toward government, slaves' attitude toward their masters, and uh, wives' attitude toward their uh, husbands. And the implication there is that it's a Christian wife married to a non-Christian husband, which probably means they, had mar they married before, uh, they, they were probably both non-Christians when they got married, and then she became a Christian. It's probably the implication. But anyway, she's a Christian. He's not. And there's a there's a term that goes through there. Submit, submit to the government. Slaves submit to um, to the, your masters. Wives be in submission to your husbands or husband. And um, so that 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 gives a uh, gives structure to that that part of First Peter. And we see that sort of thing uh, quite a bit, uh, and in fact, it, it can be it can be seen in an entire book. But we will come back to that thought in a moment. So what what I do with this is, when I'm studying a book, let's say I'm studying Amos, I begin by reading reading the book <clears throat> three times at least, and then I begin gathering up. The repeated words and phrases. Maybe, maybe on the third read, actually, I start doing that, or maybe earlier. But, but, I, but I start going through it and looking for repeated words and phrases. Now, Amos is 
relatively long, much longer than the two assignments I gave you from Philemon one chapter and Obadiah one chapter. And so it's it's harder to do, but I, I the reason I started with Philemon and Obadiah is they're more manageable. You can do the whole book. I mean, you can see the whole book in one in one shot. And um, in fact, maybe I'll use that as an illustration for Philemon. I, I read through Philemon three times and I begin gathering up and looking for repeated words and phrases. And I make a list of them along with the verses that they appear in. Then after I've made my list, I go back through the list and I begin asking myself the question, which of these are most important to the author to hit the, the flow, flow of the and to its main point? Uh, um, now that's not always easy. Sometimes that takes a while. Now, sometimes it, sometimes it's very easy. You look at it and say, this is obviously what's most important to his, to the flow of this book. Other times it's not quite so clear. And you may come up with a number of candidates for what, what repeated word or phrase is most important. And you just have to work with that. And you're trying to you're, remember, we're trying to get at the author's the original author's intended meaning. There was a reason why he repeated this word or phrase. What's his big idea? Does that come out in one word or phrase or or is it a maybe a group of them? But, but we're looking for his intended meaning and we'll see some other things that will help us with that. So that's kind of my two step process. First, I, I, I list the repeated words and phrases. Then I go through and I begin prioritizing what I think is most important. And also, and when I say most important, not most important to me, but most important to the author. And at the same time, um, I'm thinking through how they relate to each other. Are, are some of these supporting some of the others? Are they subordinate points to the others? And um, again, I'm trying to get inside the head of the, the original writer. OK, so that's a, an ending note on themes. Are there any questions about that before we go into structure? I think it would be helpful to read, it, since you're reading it three times minimum. Do you think Jenba, if that's you, could you? I'm not hearing you real clearly. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me better? Yes. OK, um, I was saying since you're reading it a minimum of three times, is it OK to use a different version? So if you're reading, say, NIV, can you say read in uh, New American Standard or I don't know, ESV or something like that? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, uh, what I would suggest is fi find what works best for you. Because there is something to be said. I mean, if you read the same one three times, then the, the language is going to be familiar as you go through it. Reading two or three uh, can be positive because it, it will it kind of shakes you up, shakes your brain up, and you see it from a different perspective. But it can cloud a little bit the repeated words and phrases, possibly. Um, because they may be translating them in different ways. But um, I, I would say try it and see how it works for you either way. And I, I personally, what I do is I, I usually, not always, I usually read out of one translation. Very often I, I read all three times from it. If I don't, then if, if I read from different translations, I'll read one. I mean, for instance, if you're using the NIV, I'll read one that's more literal and one that's more paraphrased. Since NIV is central in that, I'll read one on each side of it. But but it's what works best 
for your understanding, I would say. OK, let's talk about structure. And I'm going to give us a series of um, illustrations. I'd love it if, if, if I could say that this uh, list was absolutely definitive and there is no other kind of structure. But I can't say that. So these are these are illustrations of structure. So you'll have an idea of uh, of the kind of structure you can look for in in books. Uh, one form that we see, and and we're coming back to what I said we would come back to: repeated words and phrases. Sometimes that gives the, the structure of the book. For instance, in Genesis, ten times. Um, if you're hearing a noise in the background, one of our neighbors has security on his van and it just goes off periodically. In the middle of the night, it will go off during a thunderstorm. And uh, apparently it's going off right now, but it'll stop after a while. Okay, but in Genesis, I believe Genesis actually has two outlines. One of them are 10 statements, phrases that say, these are the generations, or the NIV says, uh, this is the account of. It appears 10 times through, through, through Genesis. And when it appears, it either gives a narrative, a, a bi bibliographical or a biographical narrative, or it gives a, a, a genealogy. Um, and, the, and when I say biographical narrative, what I mean is it, it, it's about a family, okay? Um, so you've got those, there, there's, they stretch throughout uh, Genesis. But at the same time, if you read Genesis and read it as quickly as possible, maybe not in one sitting, but uh, as close to that as you can, if you get the flow of Genesis, uh, it, there's also a thematic outline. Now, I'm very careful about thematic outlines because I don't want to impose one on the book. And I've seen that done. Years ago, I remember uh, seeing a commentary. It was probably more of a series of sermons, but he didn't call it that. I think he called it a commentary on Philippians. And he broke it down into four parts. There are four chapters in Philippians. And, and each, each of the chapters in the book, and he believed in Philippians, had a heading that had to do with the gospel. I don't remember the exact headings, and it's just as well because it, in my view, it was worthless. Um, the is the gospel a theme in Philippians? Yes. Is it the theme? No. I believe he had imposed gospel as the major theme, he'd imposed it on Philippians. And not only that, but he did it according to chapters. Chapters are man-made. They are not divine. I don't want to shock anybody, but the, the original manuscripts of the Bible, Old and New Testament, did not have chapters and verses. Those are helpful. I'm glad we've got them. But sometimes the chapter headings actually get in the way. Of, of the flow of the book. We ended the chapter and we should be reading on to the next to, to, to get the total flow. So if somebody breaks something down according to chapters, uh, they're probably, probably distorting it. There may be some exceptions to that, but overall they're probably distorting it if they, if they do that. Um, the chapters sometimes do reflect the structure of the book, but you just have to be you have to be careful and make sure that you're not distorting anything. So anyway, I, there's a th I, when you look at the flow of Genesis, it seems obvious to me that there's there, there's a thematic outline as well. For instance, you start reading Genesis. Genesis one and two is all about creation. Chapter one, the big sweep of creation. Six days, seven comes at the beginning of chapter two. Um, that's a place where the chapter got in the way a little bit. But anyway, basically, chapter one is the big sweep of creation. Basically, chapter two zeroes in on the, the creation of uh, human beings, men and women. 
And um, the men and women in chapter two are in Eden, paradise. But as we all know, we're not in Eden anymore. And um, uh, and the reason we know we're not in Eden anymore is because of chapter three. So chapter one is how the world began. Chapter three is, or chapter one and two is how the world began. Chapter three, through down through 11 actually, but chapter three and following is how the world went wrong and got worse. Chapter three, sin, sin enters in and it gets worse. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Their son Cain murdered their son Abel. It's gotten worse. And finally it gets to chapter six where God says, I'm fed up with the whole, with the whole bunch of them. And so I'm just going to clean the earth up I'm going to wash it with water. I'm going to wash it clean and we're going to start over. So he chooses Noah, who was the best, the best of the best. It didn't get better than Noah. He chose Noah and his family to start over. And if you and if you look at uh, the the flood narrative and and creation, there are parallels. It's a kind of new creation. But what happens? Noah isn't much more than off the boat until he plants a vineyard, gets drunk and naked, and one of his sons disrespects him. And it's all started over again. And it keeps on going to chapter 11. In chapter 11, we've got the Tower of Babel, uh, which is just high-handed rebellion against God. God tells them what he wants them to do, and they say, no, don't think we'll do that. Um, and and those chapters three through eleven, how things went wrong, and um, got worse. Um, I think Karen is saying she can't hear me, and I don't know what to do about that because my my speaker is up. Let me look. For some reason, my mic became muted, so I don't know at what point you weren't able to hear me. Anyway, chapters three through eleven of Genesis are how things went worse, how they went wrong, and got worse. Um, and I believe that what God is doing there is He's illustrating that if you leave it to human beings, they'll never get it right, spiritually speaking. So in chapter twelve. God said it's about to make things right. How the world began, how it got, it went bad and got worse, and how God set out to make it right, starting in chapter 12. Chapter 12, he calls a man by the name of Abram. We know him better as Abraham. And we follow out his line. Abraham, Abraham has a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob has, Jacob Israel, has 12 sons. They become the basis of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it is through those, the 12 tribes of Israel, that, the, that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come into the world. It's the beginning of the plan. And so that's, that, that is a way of, of visualizing the, the whole thing. Uh, when it comes to repeated words and phrases, you see the same, well, let me think. What is the best way to do this? You can see, you see the same thing in Matthew. Matthew has two outlines as well. And um, one of them is thematic. He alternates. Um, he alternates narrative sections with teaching sections. There are five major teaching sections in Matthew and they're and and they're interspersed in narratives. But at the same time, there's a pattern of uh, repeated uh, phrases. Well, even in those narrative sections, there's repeated phrases. Each of the narrative sections ends with something to the effect of when Jesus finished these sayings, when he finished making this teaching, and so on. 
Uh, Jim, it's yes. Molly. Uh, would you repeat that briefly? It Matthew has five of what? Matthew has five major teaching sections. One of the themes in Matthew is that Jesus as the teacher. Sometimes it's been called the teacher's gospel. That may be taking it a little too far, but that, that gives you an idea of it. Uh, Jesus is very often described as teacher, but in Matthew, there are five major sections of teaching. For instance, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five, six, and seven is in Matthew. Okay, and what I'm saying is interspersed there, Matthew begins with narrative, the birth of Jesus, and the early ministry, and then it comes down to the Sermon on the Mount. Then there's another narrative section. Then there's another teaching section, and it goes all, all the way through Matthew like that. And the, and the five teaching sections all end at the very end of them. It says something to the effect that when Jesus finished these sayings, or when Jesus finished this instruction, depending on your translation, Molly, did that clear it up? So, so there are also five major narrative sections. Well, there are actually six because it begins with a narrative and ends with a narrative. So there are actually six of those. Yes, thank you very much. And that's one of the distinctive things about Matthew, by the way. Mark, Luke, John don't have that pattern. And I'll also say Matthew is chronological, but only to a point. Some of the structure, and you can see this sometimes in the other Gospels, uh, sometimes they, they will rearrange things a little bit, not because they don't know any better, but because they're making a point with it. And if you think about it, in modern day biographies or movies, sometimes things are moved out of chronological order. There are flashbacks or there's a foreshadowing of something for effect. So, so that shouldn't rattle us. Um, it's, it has to do with structure. Anyway, we could do a lot of illustrations of repeated words and phrases as far as structure. Another one is, another, um, is thematic, which I've already mentioned. I gave one illustration of um, from, um, from Genesis, but I'll give another illustration. Isaiah, there, some, some more, what I would say, more liberal scholars believe that there were two Isaiahs. You have the original Isaiah who wrote chapters 1 through 39, and then you had a second Isaiah that wrote 40 through 66. He's sometimes called Deutero Isaiah. Some of them even say Trito Isaiah, that there were three of them. I reject that. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why. But, well, this isn't on Isaiah, so I won't go into that too much. But, 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 but um, I believe Isaiah lived a long time. And, and, and he wrote the entire thing. And one of the reasons I believe that is there's a repeated phrase, the Holy One of Israel. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but the first chapters 1 through 39, that phrase appears 12 times. In chapters 40 through 66, it appears 14 times. You may say big deal. See, it appears in both halves, and supposedly these are two different authors. It makes much more sense if there's one author, but there's something that makes it even more compelling, I think. In the entire rest of the Old Testament, that same phrase that appears 26 times in, in Isaiah appears five times. So it's fairly unique in Isaiah, and it's in all parts of Isaiah. But picking up on that idea, I mean, there's definitely a difference between chapters 1 through 39 and chapters 40 through 66. But I believe that the difference gives, in effect, gives us the outline. Chapter, the emphasis, it's 
it's not total. There are exceptions, but the emphasis in the first 39 chapters is on judgment. God is judging Judah for their wrongs. Then, then after the ax falls on them, and um, the judgment comes, then chapter 40 begins with the words, comfort, comfort my people. And chapters 40 through 66, the emphasis is on hope. Hope that comes after the judgment. But that's a thematic. But see, it's based in the, the content. And you have to be careful about that because I, I don't want to impose I don't want to impose my own view, my own thinking on the on the biblical author. Um, a third type of structure, and this is very common, especially in the New Testament. The New Testament, most of the New Testament books are letters, and um, there there was definitely a letter form in the ancient world. We uh, we still, to an extent, have a letter form. Bad things have been done to it because of uh, texting and emails, but we have a basic letter form. We say, we used to say, dear so-and-so. Now we say hi or hey. Or, hey. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we say who, say who is addressed to. Then there's the body of the, of the letter. And then at the end we say, sincerely or love you or something and then we put our name down I'm uh, please keep your mics muted um, okay the structure except when you're talking of course um, in the ancient world, they also had a letter form. And this is, I'm giving the basics of it because there are some variations, just as there would be somewhat today. But their, their letter form would be some kind of greeting. And in the greeting, they would say who was writing it and who they were writing to. Okay. From Paul, the apostle, to, to the Galatians or whoever. Okay. Uh, in the New Testament, it would be that way. But anyway, they would say who it was from and who it was to. Uh, and, and very often there would be some sort of greeting attached to that. The Greeks tended to use a, a word that was like grace. It's not the word grace, but it sounds like grace. Kind of a gracious beginning. Jews would use, uh, and still do, the word shalom or peace. Very often, Paul will combine the two and give them Christian meaning. He uses the word grace, and he uses the word uh, peace. Those would be familiar sounding to both Gentiles and Jews, but with, coming from Paul, a distinctively Christian uh, meaning. Then following the greeting, you would have a thanksgiving and prayer. Very often, uh, they say, I'm, I'm thankful for so-and-so, or I'm praying for you, or may this, may the, you know, for a pagan might say, may the gods richly bless you or something like that. Anyway, there's some kind of a, a, a prayer. Um, then there's the body of the letter, the main part of it. And a, a conclusion, and the conclusion might increase, might include greetings fr from the, the person who's writing and from people who are with him, and kind of a closing doxology or that sort of thing. May the God of peace be with you, or, or uh, th that sort of thing. Now, within the body of the letter, something that's uh, important in the New Testament in general, but especially in the writings of Paul is, um, they've discovered this, and they discovered it outside the New Testament. It's called, uh, it's called a pet per petition verb. And it functioned like this. Let's say somebody, there was bad things happened 
in one of the provinces of Rome. And uh, the, there, was, there was a drought followed by flooding. So somebody from that area writes to the emperor and says, emperor, we need help. Well, he wouldn't start out with that. He'd say, bad things have happened to us. We had this terrible drought and every, all the crops burned up and then we got rain, but when we got rain, it flooded. Therefore, I urge you, and I urge you is one word, parakalo, um, I urge you to, and then he would tell, then, then he would make his request. Well, Paul uses that, but so does Peter um, in the New Testament. They use that uh, in, in, in their writings. For instance, in Romans 12.1, Paul says, as a prisoner of the Lord, that he urges them by the mercies of God to no way. He says, therefore, it's not prisoner of the Lord there, it's in Ephesians. He says, therefore, um, I urge you uh, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as living a living sacrifice. Therefore, points back to the first 11 chapters of Romans. You always have to ask what's therefore, therefore. Uh, it points back to the first 11 chapters. And then there's the petition verb. I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And the rest of the book of Romans is practical. So in Romans, and, and people saw this, commentators saw this even before they understood the thing about the petition verb. The first 11 chapters are basically practical, I mean doctrinal, and there's a, there's a text from Habakkuk 2.4 that the righteous will live by faith, and those first 11 chapters emphasize how you are righteous by faith, and how the righteous by faith will live. Then, starting in chapter 12, verse 1, there's a pivot, and the pivot is a practical application of the principles from the first 11 chapters. In Ephesians, you see something similar to that. In the first three chapters, Paul talks about the glory of the church because of what Christ is doing in the church. Then in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I, I, I urge you, there's the petition verb, I urge you to live a life worthy of the gospel that you've received. Um, and then the last three chapters are practical. First three are doctrinal, last three are practical. And the practical build on the doctrinal, and the practical are necessary to understand the implications of the doctrinal. Peter does the first same thing in or something similar in in first uh, peter 2 11 where he uses that same verb to pivot from this this picture of um of christians in relationship to the jesus christ and and pivot to a practical application um in first thessalonians 4 1 Paul also uses it, and for a long time that puzzled me because it didn't seem to fit the pattern. And the reason it didn't fit the pattern was the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians are not doctrinal. And it puzzled me. Well, I, I was familiar with what, he, what Paul did in Romans and what he did in Ephesians, but 1 Thessalonians is different. The verb is there in chapter 4, verse 1, but but the uh, but the first three chapters don't fit the pattern. They're not doctrinal. Um, but then it occurred to me, no, they're not doctrinal. But they still give the background to the petition that he makes in chapter four, verse one. But in the case of First Thessalonians, the background is not doctrinal; it's relational. He talk, He had planted the church in Thessalonica. And he reminds them of the their conversion, what that and his place in their conversion and their relationship to God built on their conversion, and he speaks of how he was like a mother, uh, taking care of her children. He was like a father exhorting his children to to live in the right way, and it's very relational. And that's the background to then the petition that he makes. So using the letter structure. 
just the letter structure itself. Oh yeah, and I'll make one other point. This, this, uh, I'm making this about the letter, but it applies to all biblical books. Always concentrate, really spend time thinking about the way the book opens and the way it closes. The way it opens is the author's way of getting you into the subject, introducing the subject, and introducing the most important ideas. The way he closes is the way he sums up, sums up what he's been doing. So those are very important. But there's another thing. Very often in Paul's letters especially, almost always, he begins with a prayer. What is he praying about? He's praying about whatever he's writing about. And it makes sense if you think of it. This isn't just a general prayer, but it's a prayer having to do with whatever it is that's on his heart that he's writing the letter about. And so it's important that you, that you look at what he prays about in that first, early in the book. Also, if you take the prayer that he begins with at the, uh, at the first of the book, and you connect it with the petition verb that we've talked about, it'll give you the, it'll give you the purpose. It'll give you the big idea. So, so it's very important. Okay, another pattern. Um, is geographical. In Acts 1.8, Luke and Acts, Luke, the Gospel of Luke and, and the Book of Acts are Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Luke's History of the Early Church. Volume 1, Luke, is the life of Christ, and uh, Volume 2, Acts, is uh, life in the early church, and or the life of the early church, maybe is a better way to put it. And so there's a, in, there are two volumes, but the narrative just continues from one to the other. So Acts begins with Jesus still on earth, but after his resurrection. He, hasn't, he ascends. He hasn't ascended yet when we start out in Acts. And when he's talking to his early disciples, his apostles, in chapter 1, verse 8, he says to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, in that verse, I believe he gives some of the key ideas in Acts, a couple of the key words, and he gives you, an outline, he gives you the outline. And it tells you something about the nature of Acts and what's going on there and what we can expect from it. Notice a couple of key words, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is prominent throughout the book of Acts. Another key word is witnesses. Virtually every Christian, major Christian character in Acts is described as a witness. So it's a very important idea. And where are they going to be witnesses? in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's geographical. Jerusalem is a city. They start out there. That's where the Holy Spirit comes on them on the day of Pentecost. Then, as the gospel message begins to spread, they go to the next stage, a wider circle, Judea and Samaria. And then from Judea and Samaria, it spreads to the ends of the earth. Acts can be, Acts can be organized around that pattern. Uh, Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Judea and Samaria, chapters 12 through, or 8 through 12, rather. 1 through 7, 8 through 12. And then to the ends of the earth, chapters 13 through 28. Also, uh, lending... Support to that is, in Acts, there are seven growth reports, for lack of a better term. 
where uh, periodically Luke will say that the church grew and increased and so on. Seven is a symbolic number going back to creation. There were seven days of creation. There are seven days in the week. And so seven becomes a number for completeness, perfection. It's, it's a perfect week that you've got seven or a complete week. And um, so the growth reports, I think, are being used symbolic, symbolically. And when you put the growth reports with the, with the uh, outline, the geographical outline, what do you get? That the book of Acts is about the dynamic growth of the early church. I've heard other things said about the nature of, of Acts, what Acts is about. One of them, a prominent one that I've heard is that it's about conversion. Are there conversions in Acts? Absolutely. Can we learn about conversion to Christ in Acts? Yes, we can. But that's not the main thing. The, you put you you take the outline and you take the growth reports and I think you've got the main theme that that in spite of persecution, in spite of troubles within, in spite of their own prejudices, Jews against Gentiles, the church grew and prospered in a dynamic way. And and, and see the outline captures that and helps us also understand. Uh, I think helps us understand Luke's purpose. Okay, another. Uh, well, are there? Uh, I'll hold up a second again and ask if there are any questions, questions or comments. Isn't the dynamic growth of the church the theme, though? Of the, yeah. We're talk, we were talking about structure. They were saying finding structure. I'm, sa I'm, I'm saying structure. these. Uh, the question is, is, isn't the dynamic growth of the church the theme? And yes, it's the, that's the big idea. Is the church did and is meant to grow uh, and to win people? Um, and I, what I meant to say at some point, and I don't know if I ever got it out, these are not, um, these work together. So in this case, the the theme, the outline, uh, the purpose are all intertwined with each other. So the structure is trying to figure out what it is. Is it an out? Can you outline it? Is it a letter? Is it? And then that gives you. Yeah, the structure is how you outline it. And very often the outline will tell you what the purpose is. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, another another pattern uh, of structure, cyclical, cyclical. The book of Judges is built on a series of cycles. In chapter two, verse eight through twenty-three, we we get a we get the basic pattern that then is repeated throughout the book of Judges until we get not quite to the end, and I'll explain that, but. That's a little different, but there's a fourfold pattern. Judges, of course, follows Joshua, the book of Joshua. Joshua was the successor to Moses. He led the people of Israel into the promised land and they conquered the promised land and, they, and then they divided it up among the tribes. Judges begins by speaking of Joshua and saying that when Joshua and that generation of faithful people died, that, um, that there was a fourfold pattern that, that develops. After they died, Israel fell away. Because Israel fell away from God, he sent oppressors, maybe to punish them, but even more to get their attention. Okay, you've done wrong. Listen up. Bad things happen when you don't listen to me. Okay, so they fall away. Oppressors come. Third, the Israelites cry out to God. We're so sorry. We repent, even if they didn't really repent. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll assume they did. Uh, they cry out to God out of repentance. God sends a deliverer. We know them commonly as judges. 
uh, but it's important to think of them as deliverers because that was their chief function. The deliverer comes and delivers them from their oppressors. As long as the deliverer lives, they're faithful. Then the deliverer dies and they become unfaithful. Oppressors come, they cry out, God sends a deliverer. And this happens repeatedly in Judges. One of the things that I have learned that um, adds to this, and it's a powerful message, the cycles don't remain the same forever. <clears throat> the midpoint in the judges, the midpoint, mid-judge is a man by the name of Gideon. Up to, the, up, up to that point, there have been eight judges, and they have all been positive. They're all positive. Gideon is mixed. Gideon, on the one hand, has faith, and on the other hand, has a lot of doubt. On the one hand, he refuses to be king after he's delivered them, and they want to make him king, and yet he does like the idea of power and money. It's subtle, but he's mixed. He's not... he, he he, you don't get the totally good image of him that you got for, for the ones before him. The ones after him are all negative. The midpoint is mixed, but all the ones that follow him are negative, and they end with Samson. Don't know what you think of Samson, but read the narrative. Samson comes and delivers them, but Samson is self-willed, selfish, ungodly in a lot of ways, and in the end, he delivers them by destroying the leadership of the Philistines. But if you read it closely, he does not, he does not do that to deliver Israel, and he doesn't do that to bring glory to God. He does it out of revenge. And sometimes I've said, you know, you look at Samson and you say, Lord, is that the best you can do for a deliverer? And I think God would say, yep, that's, that's the kind of deliverer you deserve. So it gets worse. So the cycles don't remain the same forever. After a while, they deteriorate. Then at the very end uh, of uh, Judges, you've got some incidents that don't fit this pattern at all. And you might wonder why they're there, but you just read them closely and I, I think you'll see it. They're, they serve as kind of an appendix at the end of um, Judges, and they illustrate what a bad time it was. And there is a repeated phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. That sums it up. It was a lawless, godless period. Uh, but the basic pattern is cyclical. Without going into it in the same detail, the, I believe the book of Revelation is also cyclical. That um, there's an introduction, there are letters to seven churches, there's the throne room, room scene in chapters four and five, then starting in chapter six and going down almost to the end of the book, you've got a series of cycles. There are um, seven seals, seven, seven, seven trumpets, and so on. There are a series of sevens. Most of the most of the visions are numbered. Some of sometimes I believe there are there, there, there there's a group of seven unnumbered see uh, unnumbered visions. But nonetheless, I believe if you look at those, you'll find that it's cyclical. That that each of them has an element of God's judgment, well, persecution, judgment, and salvation. Uh, ultimate victory of the people of God. Uh, but I believe there's, there's a cyclical pattern there. So, Jim. Yeah. Molly here. Uh, you also said Revelation was thematic. Right? Did so I? So yeah, you said there's there's those seven themes that have well, the that have oh. the same uh, 
kind of the same structure. They're, the themes are different, but there are seven that have the same structure. You know, this, this yes. Yes. beast or whatever, and then the whatever and the whatever. Uh, so the point I was making from that actually is that within Revelation, a section within Revelation, and the section is the letters to the seven churches, you have you have a structure there that's seen in repeated phrases. But it's a structure within Revelation. The the cycles that I'm talking about, I believe, is the uh, is really the body. The entire book. The main structure. Yeah, okay. The way you're saying that sounds like you're not convinced. No, well, I, I'm I'm gonna chew on it. Oh, okay. Um, it is that is not my view is not really the common view of Revelation. The common view probably would be that um, Revelation is linear. It begins at this point and it has some kind of picture of history and it ends at that point. And I'm saying, no, it, that, that's not what it does at all, that it's a series of cycles. There is an end point, heaven at the end, the final, you've got the final judgment toward the end, but, but most of Revelation, uh, rather than being linear, kind of a linear history, is actually a series of cycles in which the same themes appear and they intensify, in fact. Now, this isn't a study of Revelation, so I don't want to go too much with that. But if you read Revelation, you'll find that the judgments that happen in, the, in those series of sevens get more intense as they go along, which is a little bit like judges where it deteriorates over time. In this case, the judgments become more severe over time until you have the ending point. Anyway, another another um, another structure is um, chiasmus. Um, in its simplest form, a chiasmus is it's a literary way of structuring where the where and it's used both in the Old and New Testament, where the author will say something, we'll call it A. Then he says something else, we'll call it B. Um, CH IASMUS. It comes from the word chi, uh, CHIA. Um, or AI, uh, which is a Greek letter. The Greek letter looks like an X. So think of it this way. You, at, at the top of the X, you've got A, and then you've got B, and then on the crossbar, you've got B prime. You've got B again, and then you've got A again. The idea is the author had said something, he, and then he made a second point, A and B. Then he repeats his second point, maybe in a little different form, but undoubtedly it's a, re, a repeating of the second one. And then he repeats the first one. Again, it may be in a little, slightly different form, but it's pretty definite. And I'll give an example of that. A very simple example because it can be much more complex than what I just described. Psalm 76, verse 1. In Judah, God is known, his name is great in Israel. In this case, in, in Judah and in Israel are A and A prime, they're parallel to each other. Okay, and also parallel to each other, God is known in Judah, God is known, and his name is great. Those are, those are equivalent to each other also. 
So there's there's the pattern. Um, it can be much more complex than this. Just the simplest pattern is two things are stated and then in reverse order, they're, they're stated again. Um, but it can be more complex. You can have A, B, C, C, B, A. You can have A, B, C, D, C, B, A. Usually the emphasis goes on the first one and the last one, A and A prime. But if but if there's you you've got the odd man out, if you've got an odd number, then the, the middle one gets the emphasis. Um, but anyway, that that's a pattern. Uh, some it can be used very simply, like I said, for one one statement in the Psalms or one verse, or but it can also be used for an entire book. And without going into that too much, the I believe the well maybe I will a little bit the Book of Daniel. Um, fascinating! What a fascinating, fantastic book. The book of Daniel is written in two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic was the, I had a teacher who used to say the, re, the way you learn to read uh, Aramaic is to learn to read Hebrew, and then when you get to the Aramaic, you just read real fast. Um, but but uh, the beginning of Daniel, what was that question? There was a question about when the patterns used. Yeah, I was asking, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I was asking about the chiasmus pattern. Yeah. When the author uses that particular pattern, what is the goal in terms of for the reader's understanding or what does he want the reader to gain from it? And I guess when you're explaining about what Daniel, the book of Daniel, and how it is written, that's going to help me understand it better. Like you said, it is complicated. It is complex. Yes. See, see if when I explain about Daniel, if that if that helps you with it. Uh, if it doesn't, I'll 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 take another stab at it. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Um, Daniel begins in Hebrew and it ends in Hebrew. The middle section is in Aramaic, which was the international language of the period. And so there's a very good reason why you've got Hebrew, Hebrew, and Aramaic in between. But also within that, even uh, you've got an introduction at the beginning of Daniel in chapter 1. Then in um, chapters 2 through 7, you have a series of... You have a, a chiasmus. In this case, it's A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. And it, and it goes like this. In, in chapter two, you've got a vision. Daniel has a vision of four kingdoms. That's A. That is followed by, a, uh, it could be a called a martyr story, but there but the martyrdom comes because of their loyalty to God. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, that's chapter three, martyr story, loyalty to God. Then C, you've got Nebuchadnezzar, who was the Babylonian king. You've got Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Because he was proud, the sovereign God humbles him. Okay. Uh, wait, a minute, wait a minute. Uh, B, where did B go? A is a vision of the four kingdoms. B is the martyr story, okay. and it's a story, and story of position? loyalty to God, or faithful loyalty to God. And that's chapter three. Then chapter four is Nebuchadnezzar's pride and God's sovereignty. God humbles Nebuchadnezzar. And that's C. That's C. Okay, but. Okay, now <laughs> point with your fingers where A, B, and C are again. <laughs> okay. Are, are A and B right across from each other? 
Think think of them as just being in a line. Oh, okay. Okay. C. Okay. Then we're going to then we're going to go to C prime and we're going to make another list but it's going to be the 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 reverse of the one we've just made. That makes sense. It it'd be better if I was illustrating this on a whiteboard. <laughs> okay, just think of it as A B C. A B C is Vision of Four Kingdoms. A martyr story having to do with loyalty to God, Nebuchadnezzar's pride, and God's sovereignty. Okay, A, B, C. Now, C prime, Belshazzar's pride. But there's a contrast between C and C prime. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God and he repented. Belshazzar was humbled by God and he did not repent. B prime. There's another martyr story, loyalty to God. And by the way, martyr story might be the wrong term because neither they're not really, neither one of them are martyred. They try to martyr them. <laughs> but the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace came out. And in chapter six, where you have the story of loyalty again, in fact, I think that's a better way to word it. Uh, you can say martyr story, but it's, the three, the three Hebrew children were loyal to God. That was really the point. And Daniel is loyal in spite of everything. That's when he's thrown in the lion's den. And that's chapter six. Belshazzar is in chapter five. I don't know if I said that. So Daniel's loyalty to God, a loyalty story, is B prime. And then A prime, remember A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. Then the A prime is a vision of four kingdoms. The first vision is in a human image, the four kingdoms are. The last one is in the image of beasts. They are beastly kingdoms. And I think that's that's making a point within itself. But notice what this chiasmus has. Um, has told you what what is um, most important in Daniel. The kingdoms, the vision of the kingdoms, have to do with God is going to set up a kingdom, and the and the earthly kingdoms. In both cases, the four kingdoms that are mentioned are um, are are going away. They are nothing compared to the kingdom that God's going to set up. In between there, you have loyalty. In face of the in 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 face of the or, uh, the coming kingdom, we need to be loyal no matter what the cost. And then on the inside of this thing, you've got uh, human pride in opposition to God, but He is still in control. And overall, when I look at Daniel, and, and we're not quite done because there's still chapters 8 through 12, and in chapters 8 through 12, you also have a sort of partial chiasmus. It's not a total one, but you've got a vision of two kingdoms in chapters eight, chapter 8. You've got a vision of 77s in chapter 9, and you've got another vision of two kingdoms in chapters 10 through 12. Notice how kingdoms keeps coming up, and these kingdoms are all in contrast to uh, chapter two. The four, those four kingdoms are in contrast to the kingdom that God's going to set up that's going to last forever. And in chapter seven, the four beastly kingdoms are in contrast to the kingdom that's going to be set up by the one who's like a son of man and comes with the clouds of heaven and sets up an everlasting and universal kingdom, and that's the Lord Jesus. Um, okay. Have I totally confused you? Yes. Sure, but that's okay. <laughs> Jim, um, Jim, could you diagram that and send it to us? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. My wife is amening you. <laughs> She's been saying all along that I needed to draw it out somehow, but I, I don't have, I'll have to do something with that. Uh, 
Uh, but for instance, um, there is a there is a book by David Dorsey called The Literary Structure of the Old Testament, a commentary on Genesis through Malachi. Believe it or not, it's a fairly thin book, but it's not a traditional commentary. I mean, if you want to know what the 70 of sevens means, he's not going to discuss that. But what Dorsey does do is he talks about the structure of every Old Testament book. And if possible, Dorsey loves chiasmus more than I do. But I sometimes he doesn't convince me that there is actually a chiasmus there. That's, that's one of the that's one of the issues. Is there a chiasmus? Is there not a chiasmus? I it it is more convincing to me when the actual wording you, you've got the actual wording being repeated. That that is that is more uh, convincing to me. Not, I it doesn't have to be that way, but but it's more convincing. And sometimes I'm not sure about some of Dorsey's chiasmuses. And yet sometimes what what he's doing, what he's saying about the structure of these books is brilliant. It's just brilliant. And um, he's not the only one that sees that. First and second Kings, it's been argued that that's a chiasmus. Um, the Song of um, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs is actually my preferred designation for it. Um, it's been argued that that's a chiasmus as well. And um, so that is one of the that is one of the forms. And I wanted to get through all the forms. I've got one more, but I'll I'll save it for next week. Oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> now, are you thanking me for the class or thanking me for doing it next week? <laughs> anyway, we'll come to that, and who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll think of some other patterns that I want to share by the time we get there. I know we have slowed down, but I I really came to the conclusion that if if I didn't illustrate these things pretty well that you'd hear these principles and they would and you wouldn't know what to do with them and and it also came under the heading of doing certain things that come naturally to me at this point but um not always being conscious of how you know how i do them anymore i just do them uh also one other thing is We're only partial all the way through of the study in depth. Remember, we're still in the part about studying without the help of any other books. We get to the study with the help of other books. One of the things they will help us with are some of the very things that I've been talking about. So, uh, so hold on there. Uh, you will soon receive the next um, the next uh, exercise it is different from the first two some of you will say oh good um i, th I think i hopefully you'll find it a very very pleasant experience but it is a bit different from the other two and um also just as a reminder for those of you who are interested in it the take-home test if you can believe it midterm uh, i'll be uh passing to you next week. Okay, any other closing comments or questions? Brother well, Jim, really quick, um, can you just refresh my memory? The three cycles of revelation, you said the, the seals, you said, did you say trumpets was one? Seals, trumpets, I just mentioned those two. There's bulls of wrath. There, oh. there, there are some some visions that aren't numbered, but I believe there uh, there seem to be seven of those. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But as I said, you've got a starting in chapter six with the opening of the seals. You've got a whole series of those. Okay. Yes. 
I just want to ask the at the beginning of the letter where the where they have the seven letters to the different churches or to the angels of the churches or would you count that as a cycle or no? I no, I don't count that as a cycle. That is something different. And um, one of the things about Revelation that I've mentioned is Revelation is absolutely unique. Um, and um, in chapter one, Revelation is introduced as a book, a letter, and a series of visions. Mm -hmm. And in a, and the and the um, and the letters to the seven churches are are I would that I include that in the visions. This is Jesus, the resurrected Christ, instructing his churches. Um, but it's not the it's not the same cycle that we see after chapters four and five. In chapters two and three, you've got the letters to the seven churches. In chapters four and five, you've got the throne room scene, in which John is given a vision of God on the throne, and of Jesus the Lamb. And in those two chapters, you have a an expanding cycle of praise. If you read through there you'll see that the, the cycle of praise gets wider and wider and wider through those two chapters until everything in heaven and on earth is praising God. And, and, and then it is only after that that the, that, the, that the cycles, I believe, that the cycles begin. Okay, thank you. Revelation's quite a wonderful book. They're all wonderful books. I had students who used to, who finally picked up on the fact that every semester I would say, this happens to be my favorite book. And I'd say it every semester, and it didn't matter what the book was, and the, uh, the biblical book was. Uh, when they finally challenged me on it, I said, this semester, this is my favorite book. Jim? Yes. Uh Bill Rasco, the minister of the Spring Creek Church of Christ here in Tomball, is teaching an excellent uh, series of classes on Revelation. And anyone can uh, subscribe to Spring Creek Church of Christ and pick up his Revelation classes. And there have only been three, I believe, you can get them on YouTube. They're called Worthy. And if you just look at the dates, go back to the earliest date, uh, which I think might have been September 6th. But um, I've, I just, uh, a few days ago, listened to the first two and plan to be a regular, you know, he posts them on YouTube after he teaches the in-person class, and they're, they're excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for that information. I hadn't heard about he it. Says, he feels the same. It is not linear. And well, that commends itself. There you go. Anyway, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the honor and the privilege and um, the great blessing of spending time in your word and, and, and beginning to grasp its meaning for us and for our lives and for our futures. And Father, we just ask that you would help us to be good students of your word and good interpreters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Jim. Yes. Did you already turn this off? Uh, someone, I, I uh,